Uh, thank you so much for today, Yupa, for um, this honor. Um, uh, I'd like to take a few seconds to um, thank my um, mentors, uh, uh, both official and unofficial ones, uh, Darik, Jeff, and Luis, and also to especially thank the people that work with me every day, my students and postdocs uh, who make uh, my life very fun and from whom I learn physics uh, on a daily basis. So um, with this, it's time for physics. So today I'm gonna be talking about um, many body quantum optics in atomic arrays. Uh, this is some work that uh, we have been pursuing in our group in the last uh, couple of years. So um, many body physics where we have many quantum interacting particles is uh, it's hard. And this is because interactions between particles give rise to complex physics, which cannot be understood from a detailed study of the microscopic uh, individuals or entities. So in the classical realm, we have a few examples. That is, for instance, an avalanche, which cannot be understood uh, from a detailed study of the shape of a snowflake, for instance. Another example is uh, synchronization which cannot be predicted from the biology of a firefly, of a single one. And so today I'm going to be talking about a many body phenomenon in quantum optics, that is Dicky super radiance. So here we have photon mediated interactions between atoms that gives rise to synchronization and to the emission of photons in an avalanche. And so I'm interested in this problem because here it is dissipation what drives entanglement and correlations between the atoms, what uh, develops macroscopic coherence in the system and gives rise to a robust behavior. And the big question is how do we go from the microscopic understanding of the degrees of freedom, which is how a single atom interacts with light, to being able to predict the macroscopic behavior. And so this in extended, simple, in extended systems is hard, but we have come to a bit of an understanding in uh, order arrays. So atomic arrays are a unique platform for many body physics. Um, and so to make my claim, I like to compare it with uh, conventional platforms in quantum optics and atomic physics. So the first example is uh, cavity QD. Here we have an atom or few atoms interacting with a single optical mode, that is that of the cavity. And so here uh, we have a high degree of control because we have effectively just one optical mode, uh, but perhaps not so much complexity. Uh, on the other extreme are um, dense clouds of atoms in free space. Here we have many atoms, potentially many excitations, um, and they are talking with uh, the vacuum, which means many, many optical modes. And so this thing becomes complicated to describe. There is potentially a lot of complexity, but very little control. On the other hand, um, atomic arrays get the best of both worlds. Um, the order in the system, the fact that it's crystal-like, uh, gives rise to um, control. We can also control each atom individually. On top of that, we have many atoms, therefore potentially many excitations that are talking with many, many optical modes. So there you go with the complexity. And so of course, I'm not the first person that is claiming that atomic arrays are exciting for many body physics. So um, in the last few years, we have many examples in the literature where um, Rydberg arrays have been suggested as amazing platforms for realizing quantum simulation of Hamiltonian spin models. But today I'm gonna be talking about something different that is many body physics, but not in purely Hamiltonian or, or closed systems, but instead in open and dissipative quantum systems. Our work is motivated by the amazing advances on experimental uh, science of realizing order arrays of quantum emitters of different types. So here are examples of uh, perfectly ordered 1D arrays 2D arrays and even 3D arrays of atoms generated with optical tweezers. Um, we don't need them to be atoms per se and we don't need them to um, just talk to each other through 3D uh, vacuum. We can instead have other types of emitters or other types of paths. So an example is uh, 
the, the platform of WaveGuide QED, where we have um, qubits or atoms talking through a one-dimensional uh, channel or vacuum. So this is an image courtesy of Julian, who is speaking later in the session, of um, atoms fluorescing while couple, coupled to a nanofiber. And another example is um, here, it's uh, basically a series of superconducting qubits talking through each other, exchanging microwave photons through a transmission line. So I wanted to highlight a couple of experiments that have been recently uh, published where um, people have interfaced these arrays with light and they have benefited from the interesting physical properties of these systems that rely on optical and also quantum coherence. So the first example is, oh, sorry. Um, this experiment performed in a group of Immanuel Block where they take basically an optical lattice, there is a 2D array of atoms, they send light, and the wavelength of the light is larger than the spacing between the atoms, which makes the array behave as a perfect mirror and reflect light. And so this is because of interference. In theory, we should have a 100% reflectance, oh wow, okay, 100% reflectance uh, in experiment they achieve 60%. Another example of interesting light matter interaction, this, in this case in a 1D channel, is this recent uh, experiment in the group of Gerhard Kirchmeier, where they have a pair of uh, qubits that are coupled to a transmission line. Um, and so they are able to drive what is called a dark state, a state that has a very long light, lifetime due to destructive interference, um, and uh, produce a coherent Rabi oscillation between the ground state and this dark state. So while these experiments are beautiful, um, they are produced or uh, this physics has been explored in the single excitation regime where we have one excitation shared among all the atoms or among all the qubits. And the question that I want to understand is what happens when we have many excitations. And the problem then is um, really, really hard as I will claim in a second. So I want to talk to you a bit about the history of many body quantum optics and I'm going to do that by showing what is what I believe the first example of a many body problem um, in quantum optics that is sticky super radiance. So the idea here is the following. Let's imagine that we have a bunch of atoms and we place them very far away from each other so that they don't interact with each other. If we flip all these atoms, they are going to decay and radiate photons, but because they don't see the rest of them, they are going to do so at a rate that is independently from the other neighbors, okay? So is it as if they are alone? On the other hand, if we place them very close to each other or in a cavity, they're gonna share a radiative environment and when they decay, they are going to do so collectively, which means that as they decay, they are going to synchronize and the process of photon emission is going to drive correlations between them and these correlations is go are going to produce um, a very rapid release of photons in a burst. And so this is an example of emergence of macroscopic coherence through dissipation. So let me explain a little bit how Dicky super radiance works in a cavity. So we have a bunch of atoms. They start all in some uncorrelated product state with an excitation, so atoms are excited. Um, the atoms are talking to each other through the cavity mode, which means that effectively they are talking to each other at the same rate. And so this means that there is a high degree of symmetry in this problem, which allows us to solve it exactly. And so from all the enormous Hilbert space that the dynamics could explore, the dynamics is constrained to a very small subset of states that are permutationally symmetric. So basically a photon is emitted and this punches a hole in our system. So now we have one atom in the ground state, we don't know which one, so it's in you know, a superposition. And so the next uh, uh, photon sees this state, basically is emitted from this state at a higher rate than this one was because of the correlations that have been imprinted already from the first photon. And so you can understand effectively the key super radiance as a photon avalanche. So we have a quantum fluctuation, which is a vacuum fluctuation that triggers the emission of the first photon. And then this is going to lead to an avalanche where all the photons are emitted into a, the optical mode of the cavity. And this is very important because we have 
a single decay channel which is going to collect our photons. So from the perspective of snow, what this means is that we only have one mountain ridge. And this is critical because I will talk to you about how the fact that we have many, many decay channels is going to be problematic for the onset of decay super radiance. And you can understand this picture from you know, an avalanche because if you have many, many mountain ridges, effectively the ground becomes flat and there is no avalanche uh, to talk about. Okay, so this is kind of the idea of Dickey super radiance. Um, has this been seen? Uh, is this useful? The answer to that is yes. So Dickey super radiance has been seen in many uh, different systems. Examples include atoms in cavities, uh, post Einstein condensates, um, also in solid state systems. So this is an example with perovskites. And in a recent visit to the group of Arnold Rosenbeutel, I've heard that also in for atoms coupled to nanofibers. So if you want to learn more, you can look at Christian Liddell's poster on Wednesday. Um, super radiance is also useful for developing applications such as the super radiant laser, which is a laser that operates in the bad cavity limit and therefore is more robust to thermal fluctuations. And it also um, enables the generation of multi-photon states as was explored uh, in these papers, one of them by uh, uh, Klaus Molmer, which talked to us uh, yesterday about how um, uh, these photons do not necessarily have to be focus states, but are multi-mode uh, uh, states. And so, Dickey solved this problem in a cavity. Again, I said that this yields a high degree of symmetry, and the decades-old question is, what happens when we break this symmetry and we have an extended system? Is there super radiance to begin with? And so, today I'm going to be talking about what is the many-body decay of extended systems where position dependent interactions break the symmetry that enables the solution of the problem, at least the exact solution. And if we try to do the full dynamics, again, in this case, we don't have any constraint on the Hilbert space, so the dynamics, at least solving it exactly, is exponentially hard. So I'm going to be talking about two different types of system. The first one is atomic arrays of different dimensionality in 3D vacuum. This is in free space and also atoms and qubits in a 1D vacuum, which is either superconducting qubits coupled to transmission lines or ensembles of atoms coupled to the evanescent mode of a fiber. So in the first case, we're going to have long-range interactions that decay with distance between the atoms. Uh, and the problem that we're going to have to be fighting here is that photons can be emitted in all directions. On the other hand, in the case of a 1D channel, the range of interaction is infinite because the photon is guided. Um, photons can be emitted only into two channels, either left or right. But we have to fight some parasitic or local decay that is not correlated. And so I'm going to be talking about whether these systems display a super radiant burst. And in the last part of my talk, I will talk about whether, what does this imply for the quantum state of the emitted photons. So I want to start by talking about the theoretical description of the system. So we have, in principle, n atoms, which means a Hilbert space of 2 to the n. And we have many, many uh, you know, optical modes, uh, which doesn't fare very well if you want to do a calculation. So the first uh, step in reducing the complexity is to integrating out the electromagnetic modes. And now we have an environment. And so this yields an open quantum system uh, with long range interactions that are both coherent and dissipative. So this means that now we're going to have a description of these n atoms in terms of a density matrix that has an evolution, part of it is coherent, Hamiltonian. This conserves the number of excitations, which means if an atom goes from the excited to a ground state, another one will go from the ground to the excited. And we also have a dissipative part of the evolution, which is very critically non-local, so it involves pairs of atoms. And the coupling between these atoms is given by the propagator of the electromagnetic field between these pairs of atoms. So this is where we're building the geometry, like whether we have a 1D array, 2D array, 3D array, but also where we're building the boundary conditions that determine our propagator. So are we in a cavity or are we in free space? Okay, so if we look at a cavity, uh, a cavity in resonance with the atoms doesn't have, you know, the Hamiltonian switch off. And in the dissipative part, the atoms talk to each other at the same rate. So this simplifies these uh, couplings. 
And this means that, again, we are in this permutation symmetric subspace that makes the problem exactly solvable. If we now look at what happens in free space, or also in a waveguide, what occurs here is that a given atom talks to the neighbor at a different rate uh, than uh, another neighbor and another rate than another neighbor. So now it means that we have these interactions that depend on the interatomic separation and the symmetry is broken. So to try to deal with that, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this part of the evolution because in the end, superradiance is a dissipative process. And we're going to try to understand this part in terms of collective modes. So I'm going to take my coupling between pairs of atoms. I'm going to build it as a matrix. It's an n by n matrix. I'm going to diagonalize it and find what are called collective modes. So now my um, equation for the evolution of the density matrix looks like this. I have collective jump operators, which means an atom goes from the excited to the ground state by emitting a photon. I don't know which one, so it has to be in a superposition. The coefficient of the superposition is the eigenvector of this matrix. And these jump operators act on our ensemble at a given rate that is given by the decay rate, which is gamma nu. So if this is a very large number, it means that this jump operator is very bright. The rate of photon emission via this operator is very rapid. On the other hand, if because of interference, the decay rate of this operator is very small, it means that it is very unlikely that it will act and it will be very unlikely to emit a photon into this decay channel. So what are these jump operators and what do they mean? So they basically represent the emission of a photon. From the perspective of the ensemble, what it means is that the act of emitting a photon is going to prepare a set of phases on each of the atoms, or a quantum state if you want. From the perspective of the photons, it means that this now array of atoms is going to radiate a photon with a very well-defined far field profile. So now we're going to take this expression and we're going to, you know, pretend we are not super smart. So what can we do? We're going to try to solve this numerically and hope for the best. So this is the first thing that we did. And this is the normalized photon emission rate versus time for different arrays of different geometries. So what do we learn here? Several things. The first thing is that indeed, even in extended samples, we have a burst. So that's good news. Second thing that we learn is that the dimensionality matters. 1D arrays seem to do worse than 2D arrays. And the third thing that we learn is that this is a highly depressing plot because this is only something that we can do for 16 atoms. So even though this looks, oh, sorry, even though it looks very beautiful, this array is just four by four atoms and there is no computer that can solve five by five. So if we are, care about the scaling of this system, we cannot do full dynamics. Luckily, this is not that all that we can do. Uh, there, is, there are ways around it. So the first thing that we can do is we are serious. We can kind of remove parts of the evolution as uh, we like. And the first thing that we did is we removed the Hamiltonian. And you see that when you remove the coherent evolution, you get something very similar. And this makes sense because superradiance is a purely dissipative or almost purely dissipative phenomenon. So this makes sense. Okay, so it means that we mostly care about the jumps and photon emission. The second thing that we can do is we can take a 1D chain and we can start to stretch it. So first we start with all the atoms in the same point and we stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. And what we see is that we go from this limit, which is the Dicky limit that shows a very high burst and these bursts start decreasing until we lose it completely for large interatomic distances. So when we saw this plot, we realized that actually instead of calculating the full dynamics, we could predict whether this burst is going to happen just from the derivative of this rate at t equals zero. And this is because this is a process of synchronization. So either the atoms synchronize in the beginning or there is no hope. So either the conditions for synchronization are set there or that's the end. So if that's the case, we're going to look at early dynamics. This reduces exponentially the complexity, and we're going to come up with a notion of a minimum burst, which is that the emission of the first photon enhances the emission of the second. This is critical to have superradiance. If this wouldn't happen, we wouldn't have superradiance. So now we can compute this in terms of a 
second order correlation function at equals zero, which is the rate of emission, the probability of emitting two photons correctly normalized. If this is larger than one, we will have at least an epsilon burst. And so we can compute that in terms of these jump operators and collective decay rates, and after a page of algebra, we get to the solution, and the solution is this. So if the variance of the decay rates is larger than one, we will have a burst. Um, it might be a, uh, epsilon small, but if this condition is not met, it is guaranteed that we won't have a super radiant burst. And so what do we learn from this expression? This expression is insightful because it tells you that for super radiance, what matters is how many competing decay channels do you have? And the second thing is that it's useful because instead of solving a differential equation in an exponentially large Hilbert space, we can uh, diagonalize an n by n matrix, and at least we know if we have the conditions for the onset of super radiance. So let me explain to you a little bit more about this equation. What this equation means is that dissipation either gives us super radiance or takes a, it away. So if emission of photons imprint these rip correlations in the atoms that make the emission of the next photon more likely, this depends on what type of photon we are emitting. So if we're emitting the same type of photon, the same set of phases is going to be reinforced over and over. If now we emit a photon in this direction and the next one is in that direction and the next one is in that direction, this leads to effectively a randomization of these phases and to the coherence. So what matters in the end is how many decay channels we have, and this in free space is determined by interference. So if we have constructive interference, there will be very bright channels. If we have destructive interference, these channels will not contribute. And this is controlled by the lattice dimensionality and the spacing between the atoms. And so if this is the case, uh, it makes sense to talk about a critical distance uh, beyond which we will no longer have super radiance. And so we can compute that for a race of different dimensionality. And this is what we get. So this is the critical distance normalized to the uh, transition wavelength versus atom number for a 2D array. And this is the critical distance for 3D, for different polarizations and for different geometries. And so what we see here is that the critical distance scales sublogarithmically with atom number in 2D, and in 3D it scales as a power law with them, which means that we have super radiance even if the array is, the whole of it is much larger, many, many times the wavelength of uh, light. Um, in 1D, super radiance shows a very different uh, behavior. It actually, the critical distance saturates with, uh, with atom number, and we don't have super radiance for distances beyond 0 0.3 lambda zero. And so this points to something um, special about the dimensionality of the array and the key super radiance. So this is akin to what happens in phase transition, where there is a lower critical dimension below which there is no phase transition possible because long range order is not robust against thermal fluctuations. So here, even though this is not a phase transition because it's purely decaying, it's a transient phenomenon, there is no steady state here, the same type of idea pops up. So above 2D, 2D we have enough neighbors to sustain a strong constructive interference, which leads to dominant decay channels and to effectively order in the system. Beyond 2D, so below 2D, sorry, in 1D, there is no constructive interference that is strong enough, and quantum fluctuations, meaning emitting photons in other directions, are going to kill super radiance. And actually, in 1D, there is only super radiance because we live in a world where destructive interference is possible. So 1D is actually a pathological uh, dimension for super radiance. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears. This is super radiance in arrays in free space, and I'm going to talk about wave guides. And so here we're going to have an example where we have a collection of uh, qubits. They can decay into this one-dimensional channel at a rate that is different for left and right photon emission. And we also have some sort of local parasitic decay gamma prime. Okay? So the first thing that we do, as usual, is you know we put it in the computer. We can do up to 16 qubits. Uh, we plot the normalized emission rate versus time. And we see that, indeed, we have a super radiant burst. Uh, the intensity of it changes with uh, 
the distance between the qubits. Uh, again, whether we have a Hamiltonian evolution or not, this doesn't seem to affect very much the dynamics. So that's good news for us. Because we, all the insights that we have for free space and the notion of jump operators and competition is gonna be mapped also in the waveguides. So in wavegate QED, we have now an interaction that is mediated by the waveguide. Um, it is of this form, so we have basically a, a, a some sort of non-decaying uh, plane wave that propagates through the guided mode of the waveguide. Uh, the fact that the uh, field is confined to 1D constrains the number of jump operators. So now photons cannot be emitted into arbitrary dimens uh, directions. They have to be emitted either to the left or to the right or in a superposition. So this means that we only have now two jump operators irrespective of uh, atom number. So these are the decay rates versus the lattice constant. And so you see that there is some periodicity because of course the interaction has some periodicity. Um, at certain points, which is where the lattice constant is n times pi, we go back to the Dicky limit where only there is only one bright operator and the others are all zero. And generically, we have competition between these plus minus decay channels. And this competition quenches super radiance. So now if we make our waveguide chiral, this opens the gap in the spectrum and this competition is reduced. So now, just for the sake of it, I want to show you some results. We can um, apply the same idea of uh, basically calculating the second order correlation function, and we find what are the minimal conditions to have a super radiant burst in waveguide QD. This upper plot is for decay rates into the waveguide much, much larger than to free space or parasitic coupling. This applies to superconducting qubits. Um, here we have a situation where um, the coupling into the waveguide is much smaller than the decay into free space. This applies to fibers. And so what this means is that um, if we have a very large decay rate into the waveguide, very few number of qubits is enough to sustain super radiance. And if we are in a situation of a fiber, we just need to increase the optical depth. We can also calculate this for disorder um, ensemble as, as well. And these are the analytical conditions. And I just wanted to show them to you in case somebody works in this field and is interested. Okay, so the last thing I want to comment is, okay, so this is perhaps interesting. It's an example of emergence of coherence through dissipation. And we have seen that this produces a burst in radiation. Can we learn something else about the type of photon states that are going to be generated through this avalanche process? And the answer is yes. So you, looking from the perspective of a photon, what happens is the following. The first emission is random, it's either to the left or to the right. But once this trigger process has happened, it is more likely that the photon is emitted to the right, and then again to the right, and then again to the right. Okay, so we should see something if we place detectors on both ends of the fiber. And so to this, to look at this type of decay, we have this idea of representing this decay as you know, all atoms ex start in the excited state, a left or right jump operator acts, then it acts again, then it acts again. And we could look at the photon imbalance, which is how many photons I detect in the right versus the left. And we should see that the correlations that have been imprinted in the atoms through decay should be mapped into the photons, which means that we have to generate photon states with exotic statistics. And so this is in reality what happens. So this is basically a plot that represents this photon imbalance uh, this is for a perfectly bidirectional waveguide, and you see that it is peaked uh, at uh, uh, maximum photon imbalances, which means that it's very likely that the right jump operator is acting all the time, or the left jump operator is acting all the time, but nothing in the middle. If we now have a slightly chiral waveguide, we tilt all these photons completely to the right. So what happens is that super radiance effectively make a chiral waveguide way more chiral because of this avalanche process. And the second thing that um, one is very tempted to say is that super radiance might be a source of you know, fog-like states that all come from one side of the waveguide or perhaps noon states. So this is for us too early to tell. These are results from last week. So with this, I wanted to just uh, conclude. Uh, this is a uh, we have started to understand many body decay in extended systems, and the question is, what's next? We can better characterize the states of the light that comes up, 
We can make connections with uh, phase transitions if we incoherently drive the system. If the di dynamics is purely dissipative, we can think about new computational techniques, techniques to capture this. And even though I've been talking mostly about bright states, we can also talk about you know, how we can use this many body decay to prepare dark states that are entangled and that can have meteorological advantage. So with this, I wanted to just uh, mention that um, our work is uh, probably, <laughs> hopefully, very well represented in the poster session. And so Ricardo is going to be talking about um, how to dissipatively stabilize a quantum dimer phase using a squeeze bath. Sylvia is going to talk about the key super radiance in waveguide QED. So any hard questions you have for me, you can actually ask to Sylvia. Uh, and Stuart is going to talk about the key super radiance in arrays of multi-level atoms. So this is an idea of, well, there is still a hard constraint of the distances between the atoms. Can we use uh, highly excited states from iterbium or strontium um, and see if this is going to produce a super radiant burst that can be observed in the lab? So with this, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in my group, in particular, the people uh, directly involved in this work, which, is, which are Stuart, Eric, Sylvia, and Zoe. Um, if you're interested, here are some references, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank, thank you, Anna, for this beautiful talk. If you have interesting results, are there any questions? So I, I'd like to uh, understand more about how the, um, the excitation is done. Because you talked about how important it was, what the phase was between the atoms. But I'm, I'm imagining that, for example, if I used a weak uh, excitation from a laser in a particular direction, then there would be a phasing of the excitation. But if I do everything into a pi pulse at the beginning, then there's no phase. So could you say a little bit about what the initial, initial excitation looks like? Yes, so the question is, uh, what's the impact of the initial excitation? So for instance, if we're driving a uh, laser to the ensemble, uh, this is gonna produce some coherent state or a spin state, and so what's the impact of that uh, in the dynamics? So definitely there is, uh, there is an impact of that. So in all the work that I've been talking about today, uh, we start with a perfectly inverted state. We can do calculations for uh, you know coherent spin states which that are not exactly inverted. We have done that for when they are racing free space. And so you can see that when you imprint a phase with a laser, basically because a laser couples mostly to bright states of arbitrary excitations, what happens is that the emission direction changes dynamically. So basically you start populating very bright states that they radiate, they decay, and then the dark states start to appear, which means that you know, in one day you would go from, if this is the chain, you would radiate first in that direction and eventually the, the direction of emission will be like to the edges. So that definitely has an impact and we can uh, account for it. Uh, analytically is harder. Maciek, please. Um, first of all, thank you for a very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, when I was young and ugly, um, super radiance was also in the middle of interest, but what I wanted to ask is that uh, my first paper in Physical Review A actually is on superfluorescence, which is a very much related pro, uh, process, but which indeed occurs in gases phase and in elongated samples, and it was observed in experiment and led also to uh, pulses which are proportional to n squared, so number of atoms squared. Uh, I'm talking about, so what is the relation of superfluorescence to what you are talking? I also want to mention that the theory of superfluorescence at that time was formulated by my mentors whom I loved very much and who are late, unfortunately Fritz Hacke and Roy Glauber, uh, and this was a very intelligent theory in which they studied the beginning of the process, which is really by, due to spontaneous emission of individual atoms in the linear regime, and then they glued this quantum theory with the completely classical theory of the later evolution because then the field is already strong and you can apply classical thing. Still, it leads to macroscopic quantum fluctuations, for instance, of the ar arrival time of the superfluorescent pulse because it is caused by this quantum random processor, which is enhanced by the 
superfluorescence or if you will super radiance process. So can you comment on that and maybe uh, think about applying this kind of ideas to your situation? Yeah, so the question is what's the connection with uh, superfluorescence and what's the connection also with like previous work of uh, Glauber and others. So for me, superfluorescence and superradiance are very similar phenomena, like to my, and in my uh, understanding, this is like different communities call them differently. Um, what I think is different from previous work is the fact that we have order arrays makes things very simple. So if you look at the um, previous work in the 80s, for instance, Harosh has this very beautiful review uh, where they are thinking, you know, of in free space, once you break the symmetry, what produces the quenching of super radiance? And well, they claim it's a dipole-dipole interactions mediated by the coherent Hamiltonian. And in this, indeed, they are there. But, um, and then they think, well, maybe a ring will do better than a chain because a ring is permutationally symmetric if we exchange atoms. Uh, and we show that 1D uh, chain and our ring is exactly, it behaves very similarly. Uh, and I think the, the, what is new in this work is the fact that the arrays are ordered means that these dipole-dipole type of interactions, Hamiltonian, are very suppressed in the sense that if you have a random cloud, like a cigar-shaped cloud, if it's, if it's very low density, super radiance won't happen. If it's medium density, it will happen. If it's too dense, then you have atoms that are arbitrarily close and it's going to deface everything. The beautiful thing of arrays is that there is this coherent interaction, but it's uh, in the end only the edges uh, deface at a different rate. And then it's like a bulk versus edge type of problem. And so you can throw away the Hamiltonian if you mostly care about the dissipation. And then the Hamiltonian will creep in because it will scramble states at uh, low uh, density of excitations. So, I mean, we can talk about uh, details later. It will be great. Okay, so. Hi, thank you for this great talk. Uh, so what I have learned from your talk is like the super radius behavior not only depends on the dimensionality of the atom arrays, but also depends on the dimensionality of the night modes you are considering. So for my curiosity, I was wondering first, has people started the case that, for example, you have a 1D ring of atoms, but a couple to a ring resonator? So in that case, the left and the right mode eventually circulate. Uh, that's maybe my first uh, curious question. The second one is, has people started the case when like maybe 2D atom arrays coupled to a 2D photonic crystals? Yeah, Thank so you. The question is whether people have studied 1D arrays coupled to 1D photonic bats and also 2D arrays coupled to 2D crystals. Uh, I think the answer to both is no, but in reality I think a 1D array coupled to a 1D cavity, like a micro ring resonator, goes back to Dicky super radiance, so again, you should have, uh, you should, it, this should exist uh, as soon as you overcome the dissipation into free space, you should have Dicky super radiance as, you know, atoms in a cavity. Uh, and to my knowledge, nobody has an, a study 2D in 2D. Over here. Yes, um, about the, um, the plot that goes in zigzag of the, um, it's over there. Oh. The <laughs> <laughs> the length scale at um, at which you stop having super radiance as a function of number of atoms um, that goes a little bit in zigzag. So I was wondering, first, oh, yeah, yeah, wh sure. why does it go like that? Uh, is it just a numerical curiosity? Yeah. Um, and then also the scaling in square root of log n. I was trying to make some kind of sense to it, but yeah. I cannot because I guess my in my idea I would like you know an, an atom. It has a, it emits a field. The field is going to decay, um, you know, as like um, one over r, one over r squared, depending on like what is going to be the dimensionality of the yeah. thing. And so I would more expect always some kind of more like power law because, depending on if you're on a string or if you're on a disk, uh, then you, your field is going to decay as well as one over r, one over r squared, one over r squared yeah. over r, whatever. Uh, but I would more expect power laws type of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. so why would yeah. it look like that? So the question is, why are these things squiggling, basically? And the second question is the origin of the power, the uh, sub-logarithmic scaling in 2D. So um, I should say that these plots are first, like the crosses are basically numerics, uh, but 
the lines are feeds that we obtain analytically. So we have the analytical description for this, and these two things agree. Um, so these jumps occur because, um, again, this happens because of constructive interference. There is this one over R uh, type of interaction, which makes, um, you know, you have these uh, very long range interactions happening. And so it gets to a point where you add like a additional, like a um, lay, uh, row of atoms, and then the whole array is resonant with a whole mode, you know, you, it fits a new one. So that's why it suddenly jumps. So that happens for both 2D and 3D. And with respect to the scaling, in the end, this is as always like uh, some dimensional analysis. You have to do an integral in a momentum space of some propagator. And uh, basically in 2D, you have these uh, decay rates that divert uh, at the light line. So the more atoms you put, the more, um, um, uh, the largest is this divergence. And you approach this divergence in a logarithmically fashion. So that's how this appears. And of course, because it's an issue that comes up from this integration, and integration depends on the dimension, the scaling changes from 2D to 3D. Last question over there. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, when you were comparing the simple linear 1D uh, condition with the circular, with the ring yeah. uh, system, uh, you are doing simulation with n equal 16, I remember, and I was quite surprised that these two uh, decay rates are quite similar, uh, given I was expecting a huge boundary condition difference on this, so can you explain why it's so close? Yeah, Please. so um, again, in the end, I think the critical point is to realize that the quenching of super radiance happens because of dissipation. So now both the ring and the array can emit in all directions, okay? And only if you make these chains small enough, like in the, the lattice constant small enough, then there is interference that somehow protects the super radiance. So the ring and the chain are only different in the edges, okay? So if you have a large ring, the a small, like, coherent part that uh, you're not, uh, you know, uh, that is not cancelled because of permutation symmetry, it's only at the edges. So if you have a very long chain, it's like you have much more bulk than edge, therefore a ring should behave very similarly to a chain. If you make the chain very short or the ring very short, you should start seeing differences. But for long enough chains, like with enough, atom numbers, they behave very similarly. Also, perhaps not at long times, but definitely at short times, at times of the burst. So, Anna is going to be here the full week, so I recommend that you talk to her during the coffee break and lunch, and let's thank her again for her wonderful talk.